So this is EE698G, lecture three. So let me quickly summarize what we saw in the previous class. We first saw how to implement a flash TDC. And what was the crucial block that we required for implementing this TDC? So you needed a buffer which had a which had the delay as a resolution that you required, right? So we assumed that for that particular scenario, we assumed that we had a buffer which had a hundred picosecond delay. Then we looked at how easy it is to achieve this hundred picosecond delay. So it turns out the problem is not achieving the particular number. The problem is achieving that hundred picosecond delay across process voltage and temperature. Consistently achieving this 100 picosecond delay was the bottleneck, right? Because we found that as your process varies, the delay is going to vary. If you have variations in voltage, again, delay will vary. Similarly, delay was a function of temperature as well. So we had process voltage and temperature to take care of. Or in other words, our TDC design should function as expected, even if there is some minor variations in PVT, right? And then what did we think we should do? We had to use some sort of feedback. So if you are using feedback, you need a reference. And we decided because the reference we needed was a time reference, we would use the clock period, which can be given as input to the system as a reference for us. So let's say we had some clock period. We said that our clock period cannot be same as 100 picosecond. It's not that it cannot be saved, it's going to be very hard. Mm -hmm. So we said we'll use a higher clock period. And instead of trying to lock the clock period to a single buffer, we will take a chain of buffers. Right? So let's say we took n buffers. So this is now my input. This is the output. So we have n buffers in this chain. And we lock the total delay from input to the output to t clock. Now, if all of these buffers are identical, so if we follow the design rules to make these buffers identical, then what is the delay of each buffer? This will be equal to T clock by N. All right. So now if your T clock was one gigahertz and you wanted 100 picosecond, what would you choose as N? So your T clock is one gigahertz. So that is how much? So this is one nanosecond or equal to thousand picosecond. So we want T clock by N to be equal to hundred, which means N is equal to 10. Now one gigahertz is not a very high frequency. It's achievable. N equal to 10 is also not such a large number. So you can easily do this. Now, for example, let's say one gigahertz was also a little hard. I have a 500 megahertz clock, right? Then how many delay elements? You double it. So you will have 20 delay elements. Again, very much achievable numbers. You can easily have 32, 64, et cetera, as your number of delay elements, right? That is not a problem. Okay. So now the question is, how do we achieve this lock? Like provided we can achieve the lock, we are fine. Now we have to figure out how to achieve this lock. So let me quickly sketch out the in and out waveforms. Okay, now let's say the out waveform is delayed by some amount, but it is still not locked to T clock. So let's say it is like this. So the first edge occurs here, the second edge of the delay line at this point, et cetera. Now let me mark this as some delay delta one. What do you want this delta one to be? You want this delta one to tend to T clock, right? Let me also mark the other delay. 
So I'm going to call this as delta phi. So this is now in phase domain, but you know how to quickly convert between phase and time domain, right? So now if delta one is tending to t clock, what should delta phi tend to? Right, so delta one tending to t clock means that this edge, the delayed version of this edge has to now occur at this location because this is one t clock. Right, t clock is one clock period. So if delta one is tending to t clock, which means the first edge has to appear at this location, which means when delta one is tending to t clock, delta phi is tending to zero, okay? Huh. And it also means that when an output edge is occurring at the, uh, at the output of the delay line, you will have the next edge occurring at the input, yeah. right? Because you are trying to make this edge appear at this location. So when an output edge is occurring at the output, you want the next edge to be occurring at the input. It is delayed by one whole clock period. That is what it means, right? This into out, you have one clock period delay. And why are delaying out? So our aim is not to delay the out. Our aim is to obtain this T clock here. Once you have the delay between in and out as one clock period, it means that the delay of one buffer is T clock by. Yeah. We, does the frequency change? Frequency doesn't change. Frequencies are all the same, right? You just have a delay of T clock from in to out, right? And what that means when we look at the waveforms is when an output edge is occurring at the same instant, the next input edge should be occurring at the input of the delay, line, right? Is this clear? So now instead of trying to make delta one to T clock, I can simply focus on making delta phi to zero. I've changed the problem statement slightly, that's all. Okay. So now let us look at how this can be implemented. So I take a delay line. So I take a delay line. So this consists of multiple buffers. So this is the input and I have the output here. Now I take the output. And I take the input and I somehow have to detect that delta phi. Right? So I have to detect <laughs> this delta phi here. How we'll detect it, we'll learn in few classes. But the idea is I take the input, I take the output, I compare the edges, I detect the delta phi. Once I have the delta phi, I will do some pro processing over it. Again, don't worry about what the processing is, right? And based on this output, I now have to go and change this delay. I have to go and change this delay in such a direction that the delta phi detected here is going to go to zero. So basic negative feedback loop in action. So I detect a quantity based on the input and output, do some processing, go and tweak something in the loop such that this delta phi becomes equal to zero. And if this delta phi is equal to zero, that means that the, this first delayed edge is occurring at this instance which means that the delay of the delay line is now one clock period. It's one clock period, and if you have 10 elements, so we can have a zero. Exactly, yeah. If you ensure delta is equal to zero. I'll come to that. This is actually correct. If you ensure that delta phi is equal to zero, right? So now we have defined delta phi as a delay between this edge and the uh, next input edge. So somehow we have to make sure when we are detecting delta phi, we detect it correctly, yeah. right? If you simply uh, 
you know, if you're not very careful enough, it's possible that this edge can go and lock to the next rising edge. In which case, the delay can become twice of the clock period. Okay? So we learn how to avoid this mistake also. But for now, assume that this issue is not there. We are not just making those two signals in phase. We are also ensuring that the, clock, the delay is only one. Correct. We are ensuring that the locking is happening between the first delayed edge to the next input edge, not two input edges after that. So again, this delta five detecting delta five block is now a mystery. We don't know what it is, but we know what it has to do. Okay. So now the question is the delay line is not a regular delay line anymore. It cannot be a single buffer chain. If it's a single buffer chain, you don't have a provision to go and tweak the delay. Right. So you have to tweak this delay based on some control signal. And usually that control signal is going to be a voltage. Right? So I'm going to call this as V control. Okay. So this delay line is now a programmable delay line. So you can say it as programmable delay line, variable delay line. Another term is tunable delay line. All of them mean the same thing, right? It's just different English words to mean the same thing, which is that the delay can be varied. Right? And that tune up, the variable which is controlling the delay is going to be a voltage. So we call this as the voltage controlled delay line. Right? Okay, so now we have to see how to implement this delay line also. Now, once you know that this is voltage controlled, and we also know that this control voltage has to be held steady so that at all times, the delay line is going to give you some constant delay. And if you have to hold a voltage, what element will you use? You have to hold a voltage in the circuit, what can you put? A capacitor, right? So that has to mean that this VC is now stored across a capacitor. Okay, now if we have a capacitor, what comments can you make about this module here? So if it is detecting a finite delta phi, we want to change the voltage on this capacitor, right? So that we can tune the delay to the right value. If you want to change the voltage in a capacitor, what should you do? You have to either push a current or discharge it. Right. In other words, you have to push charges into the capacitor or pull charges out of the capacitor. Okay. So then I can simply say this module has to push or pull charges. Okay. Correct. Right. So now for a given value, for a given process, voltage and temperature, there is going to be a magic value of VC that will ensure that this delay is one clock period. Now, if the temperature changes, then this value of VC needs to change so that the delay remains constant at a clock period. Is that clear? <laughs> so anytime the temperature changes, you will have a finite delta phi, right? Because of which some input will be given to this module that will then push or pull charges out of the capacitor so that VC settles to a new value which again gives us the clock period across the delay line. Okay, so take a minute, feel free to discuss, see if you have any questions on this overall feedback loop. We will have some device to see we have achieved the clock or not, right? We'll have a circuit to see to detect the delta phi. And then how do we compute that if it's not set? If the delta phi is zero, it has to mean that the T clock, the if delta phi is zero, then it means that delta one is T clock. Right? That's all. So we have a circuit here which can detect the delta phi. 
if the delta phi is finite, we will either push or pull charges out of VC, out of the capacitor so that the VC value will change. And we'll keep tuning the VC till delta phi becomes zero. So instead you want to measure, uh, huh. so the other method would be you would measure delta one. Now you have to make delta one equal to T clock, right? It's easy to make a value closer to zero. You don't need any other additional references. Otherwise you have to figure out you have delta T clock stored somewhere. You have to make this delta one, measure delta one and tend it to T clock. So it's much easier to measure delta phi and make it to zero. One question at a time. When delta phi is tending to zero, that means we cannot the input and output. So input and output are at two different locations, right? So you should be able to differentiate which is input and which is output. Yeah. So the loop will also be able to, uh, so the module we use here should also be able to detect a negative delta phi and a positive delta phi. What is that delta to uh, then, then it is a problem. So, yeah. huh. so you have to take care of few things such yeah. that yeah. that situation doesn't happen. Okay? Uh, so that we learn when we learn about the loop in detail. But for now, let's assume that the yeah. inputs are given such that you don't get multi integer multiples of t clock plus some delta. Yeah. If delta phi, so delta phi is defined between this edge and this edge. It is lesser than one clock period. So let me redraw the clock again. So let's say this is your input. And let's say this is my output. So the first edge appears at the output after a delay. I'm calling this delay as delta one. The distance, so this is delta one. Now the distance between the first edge at the output to the second edge at the input is what we have called as delta phi. Okay, so now if delta phi is tending to zero, that means that this edge is now occurring here. The signal is occurring like this. Right, delta phi tending to zero means that this edge is moving in this direction. And when delta phi is equal to zero, it has appeared here. At that instant, delta one will be equal to one clock period. Is that okay? It take time to discuss and then ask me questions. N is decided already. This is the number of buffers you put on the circuit. Right? So now this is a circuit that is fabricated on a silicon type. Number of buffers is fixed by the designer even before it goes into fabrication. On the chip, as many buffers you have laid out will be there. So N is already decided. T clock is an input that you give when you are using the chip. So that is again decided either by the designer during testing or by the customer, right? So T clock is decided, N is decided, right? We just have to make sure that the delay line locks to a T clock. Total delay of the delay line is one clock period. Once we do that, each buffer will have T clock by it. So now, we are constructing a feedback loop to ensure that the total delay of that delay line is one clock. So this is the rough sketch of the uh, 
feedback loop. Is this okay? So now what should we, hey, you have a question? Uh, out, so the in has a period of T clock. If I'm considering a 50 percentage duty cycle signal, this will be T clock by two. Huh. Out is a delayed version of the input, right? So it has to be the same input delayed by some time, right? So half cycle will be T clock by two. This has to be T clock by two. Huh? No, T clock is from this point to this point. Half cycle is from here to here. Achha, the green diagram. Oh, so, uh, it's just a delayed version. So if like this. So the signal you can. Start from that point. Right, because it is delayed and it is starting from that point. Before that, there is Before that usually it will be zero because it, an inverter is there to drive it. Right? So if I were to draw multiple cycles, maybe it will get clear. So if this is the input, the output could be something like this. Right, and ideally we want all of these edges to shift. Right, so how it will happen is these edges will slowly shift, and eventually after some time the locking will be correct. It's a feedback loop in action, so things doesn't happen at a at one instant. So these edges will slowly begin to shift every time delta phi is detected and VC is tuned, and eventually they will align. But to understand this, you can think of the waveform being shifted and aligned to the uh, next edge. So anytime you have a rising edge at the output, at the same instant, you have the next rising edge at the input. That is what this waveform was telling you, right? You want this edge to occur here. So anytime you have a rising edge at the uh, output, the next rising edge at the input has to occur. So the ideal waveform you are looking at is, if this was your in, your out should be like this. So the edge one has occurred here, edge two occurred here, edge three occurred here, etc. Okay, so now this loop is ensuring that the delay of the delay line, delay of this buffer chain is locked to one clock period. What should we call this loop as? It is locking the delay, so we call it as delay lock loop. So this is called as a delay locked loop. So this is a loop that is locking the delay of the buffer chain to a given reference. So we call it as a delay lock loop. Again, terminologies are very straightforward in circuit design. Yeah. In the delay, I have to use number Right. What is this from computer? So if you do a... No, no. So let's say you made some temperature variation, right? So the moment the temperature varies, you would expect the delay of this delay line to change, right? So the delay has changed. You're not getting T clock anymore. So the moment it is not T clock, your delta phi is not zero. So you will detect some delta phi. You detect your delta phi, which means corresponding to that, you are going to either push or pull charges out of the capacitor. Because of this, the VC changes. When VC changes, the delay will change again. 
So the VCDL characteristic, we haven't seen an implementation yet, but you can think of something like you change your VC, your delay is going to change. Let's say this is the delay of the delay line. Right? So VC is the control voltage that you are applying here. This is now not a regular buffer. It's a fancy buffer for which the delay is a function of a control voltage. Right? So now let's say you want to be on this T clock period, right? So you would simulate for the characteristics of the delay line, let's say at SS corner, you will also simulate for it at TT corner. Now for TT corner, you will see that the characteristic is slightly different. At every point, the delay is going to be smaller, right? So now you are interested in locking to T clock, which means depending on the corner, the value of the VC is going to be different. So this is some VC1, this is some VC2. Okay, so your VC value is going to change. So this value has to change such that the delay across this buffer chain is a constant. So if temperature changes, its delay will change. The loop will detect the delta phi. Corresponding to that, it will either push or pull charges and the VC changes to the new value. So at every PVT corner, any combination of process voltage and temperature, there has to be a magic value of VC that will give you T clock speed. Is that okay? The number of buffers that we want is decided by the word clock frequency that we have and the word clock, what the time period, we, the delay that we want across the buffer. Correct. Or right. by anything else. So uh, you can, so you would design a buffer, right? You would design the buffer such that it can lock to a particular clock period. And uh, so that yeah, you will add enough buffers to. So it depends on what is the uh, T clock by N you want, right? So you want some resolution. T clock and N are two variables that will allow you to achieve that. So you choose what should be T clock. N gets fixed and we can change T clock according to the VC you want and then we can do the That is one way to think about it. But what usually happens is the consumer will tell you, this is the clock I have. This is the resolution I want. So you will uh, you will include that. Uh, you will fix the end depending on that required. And sometimes the customer will say, I want a, a, this is a range of clock period that you can have. So then it becomes an optimization algorithm. How, which clock you want to use, what end you want to use, you can decide. And there are cases where the customer gives you a very low frequency clock. Then you'll put a clock multiplier first get it to a higher frequency, and then decide the end based on that. So all of these are options. Okay. So it makes sense to control all the buffers. Uh, again, implementation is up to the designer. If you are able to achieve what you want to achieve by using only one delay line, that is sufficient. But thing is, uh, this T clock by N, is under the assumption that all the buffers are matched, right? So if you are interested in matching the buffers to obtain this T clock by N, then you need to make sure all the buffers are identical, which means the control voltage is control voltage has to control all the buffers. Now there are other implementations, other reasons why you would want to use DLM. Now in some of those cases, it might not be necessary that you want all the buffers matched. In which case you can have one part as tunable, there is one or two buffers which are controlled by VC. You can have regular buffers after that. Okay. So we said that this loop is called as a delay lock loop. Now the module that is pushing and pulling charges into the capacitor is called as a charge pump. And the module that is detecting the delta phi is called as a phase detector.
Now you'll see that in most DLL implementations, we prefer a particular type of phase detector called as the phase frequency detector or PFT. Okay, so now all of these modules, the phase detector, charge pump, the voltage control delay line, these are mystery modules for us. So let us remove that mystery. We have to take one module at a time and see how they can be implemented. So let us start with the easiest of them, which is the variable delay line or the voltage control delay line. Any questions so far? So voltage control delay line consists of multiple buffers, right? Now one buffer will consist of two inverters. So if I can figure out how I can tune the delay of an inverter, I know how to construct a voltage control delay line. So this in short is called as VCDL. Okay. So our aim now is to figure out how I can tune the delay of a single inverter, very simplified problem. Okay. So now we know delay is a function of both charging or discharging currents <clears throat> or it is a function of the capacitance that needs to be charged or discharged. So then it reasons to stand that if I can either tune the charging or discharging current or I tune, I vary the capacitance, I should be able to vary the delay. Okay. So let us start by first looking at how I can vary the current to vary the delay. So let me take an inverter. You have the input, output, connected to some capacitance. So let us simplify the problem one step further. Instead of trying to tune both charging and discharging currents at the same time, we will focus only on tuning the discharging current. Okay. And we know that the control parameter is some voltage VC. So now we have to make some change to this part of the circuit such that when VC changes, this I changes. Take a minute, see if you can come up with some technique. And if you have already seen this lecture for some project, then uh, let the others think. We can put a resistor, which is varying with VC. Where would I connect the resistor? In parallel to CL. Right, now I have a resistor which is parallel to CL, right? What comments can you make about the voltage swings at this node? Very good first attempt, right? But now let's say I have an input signal varying from zero to VDD like this. Ideally, my output signal would have gone from VDD to zero. Now, will the swings reach VDD? Because when your input is zero, that is when we expect the signal to reach VDD. Your NMOS is off, but your PMOS is on. But some part of that current will now flow through the resistor. Right? So you will have static power consumption, and your signals will not reach a VDD. Is that right? So very good first attempt. Now, can we improvise on that? Feel free to discuss and then give me a solution. So we are tuning the current, right? So the solution that has come up is you add one more transistor in the pull down path and connect its gate to VC. 
right? So before we get into the details, let's get a feel for what happens when you have a transition. So let me call these transistors as M1, M2, and M3. I'm going to call this potential as Vx. Now let's say my input is going from 0 to VDD. Oh no, we are looking at a discharge path now, fine. So my output is going from VDD to 0. Let me consider a point T1, another point T2, and another point T3. Let's quickly analyze how the behavior is going to be at these three stages. Now, at the instant T1, can you tell me what would be the Vx value? You're telling me it is Vc. Okay, so at T1, what is the value of input? <laughs> it is zero, right? So what comments can you make about M2? It is in cutoff. So let's assume that Vx was Vc to begin with, right? A good assumption again. So let's say it started with Vc. Is M so if I say Vc was equal to Vdd by 2, let's analyze for a particular scenario. Is M3 on or off? On. on. Now, can you revise your answer about Vx? Yes. It has to be zero, right? So M2 is off, which means there is no current through M2, which means there cannot be any current through M3. But because Vc is VDD by 2, which is greater than the threshold voltage, Vc is on, channel is formed, right? So if there is no current, it has to be in linear region with zero Vds. So Vx is at zero. What is the region of M3? This will be in linear region, right? Now let us consider some point here, right? During the transition. Can you tell me what comments can you make about Vx? Is it zero, is it VDD or something else in between? It has to be positive. Uh, it will depend on the threshold voltage, sizes, etc. So during this instant, actually the capacitor is getting discharged through M2 and M3. So a current is flowing through M3. So Vc will be some positive value. What comment can you make about the region of operation of M3? It could be linear or saturation depending on the actual Vs value. And at T3, So VI is at VDD. What is your output? At T3, the output is at zero. So VX is? Feel free to discuss before answering. Will it go to zero? Will that upper go to zero? Vx has to be zero. Why zero? Correct. So once this has reached zero, this node is also zero, and you don't have any current flowing further, right? The capacitor has been completely discharged. The PMOS is anyways off. So there is no current flowing through the pull down path, which means this voltage also has to be zero. Is that clear? So this is in zero and M3 region. It has to be linear region. Okay? So this is in linear region. So you understand what is happening during a discharging operation. So you have this Vx, which was initially at zero, M3 initially in the linear region. As it begins to discharge after M2 turns on, 
your Vx is going to slightly increase. Now, depending on the relative sizes of M2 and M3, M3 can either remain in linear region throughout or it will enter into saturation region. For most values of Vc, it will enter into saturation region for some time and then eventually come back to linear region. Right? So this is a very nonlinear operation with the transistor regions also changing. Right? You know that the M2's regions are anyways going to change. It is going from cutoff to saturation to linear the MOS transistor in a regular inverter, right? So, but one comment that we can make for sure is that when I increase the VC, the overdrive of M3 is increasing, which means it can support larger currents, which means what happens to the delay? The delay will reduce, right? The VC increases, discharge current is increasing, effective resistance of the pull-down path is decreasing, Therefore, delay will reduce. Okay? So I increase VC, the delay will reduce. I decrease VC, the delay will increase. So far, OK? Right? So now we have figured out a method by which we can tune the discharging current. Can you quickly tell me what happens if VC is equal to 0? M3 is in cutoff, there is no discharge path, right? So now if I were to plot the characteristics, so control voltage here, I'm plotting TPHL here. Let's start with VDD. This is when the delay is going to be minimum or maximum? The delay is going to be minimum, right? So as your VC is decreasing, you would expect the delay to keep increasing. And as it approaches the threshold voltage, the delay will increase rapidly. And beyond this, you will not see a delay because the edge itself is not appearing. You have a rising edge at the input, but there is no falling edge at the output. Okay. Now let me put this in the context of the loop. Right. So now you have a loop here. So let's say due to some reason, uh, the loop took this VC to zero, which means you don't have an edge at the output. Is that okay? Should we be worried? Why should we be worried? It is not? Following the input following It is not following the input, okay. Is there a stronger reason? the loop is disconnected, right? So you don't have an output, which means this module is not able to detect a delta phi, right? So if in a negative loop, if something goes beyond what we require, but if the feedback loop is able to bring it back, then for most purposes, we are okay. We'll treat it as a transient and we'll move on. But in this particular case, if VC reaches zero or it goes below the threshold voltage, you don't have an edge at the output which means the loop is now broken. It becomes an open loop delay line and you cannot come back from it. Okay? You have, you'll have to reset the whole circuit to be able to come back. Is that clear? So we do not want a situation where the delay line is not... Here the output, uh, it is high, it won't keep on going back to zero. Correct. It will remain high. Already. It will remain high. You can detect a delta phi only if you have two rising edges. Right? So you have an edge going in. The next edge is not coming out. So it is not able to detect a delta phi. Once it goes down, then I need to reconnect Right. Is that clear? You have a doubt? Yeah. And for content from VC 0 to VT, it, huh? open, open. it is open loop. It is in closed loop. Initially, let's say it is working like closed loop. Then let's say the temperature changed. Right? So this circuit is simply detecting delta phi and changing VC. So let's say it detected a delta phi because of the temperature change and it changed the VC such that it pushed it below VT. Now suddenly the loop has become uh, open loop. Okay, so we want to avoid the situation where the delay is infinite. 
what change can you recommend to the circuit? So again, focus on the discharge path. Look at what change you need to make so that you can get a finite delay, even if VC is zero. You add VC plus VTH over there. But VTH is also a function of uh, temperature and process. Is there a simpler solution? We need to add a parallel path, right? So where do I add the parallel path? So what he's suggesting is we add a parallel discharge path. So that even if VC is zero and this turns off, you still have a path for the discharge current. Now, where do I, where can I add the parallel path? From the drain of the bottom transistor. So I need to add a very weak current source. This is okay. So whenever the NMOS, this NMOS turns on, it still has a weak current. It can still support some weak current through this weak current source. And how do I add a weak current source? I can put a resistor. Can you suggest a solution with a capacitor uh, with another transistor? So I can add a resistor, but the value of that resistor needs to be very large, which means the area occupied by that resistor is going to be large, right? So a solution with a transistor. Yeah, you can add another transistor here. You size its W by L such that it is a very weak, uh, it has a very small W by L. And then you can directly connect this to VDD so that it is always on. If you, if you want, you can generate a reference such as VDD by two and connect it here. That is also fine, right? You can generate a bias voltage and connect it here. But if you don't want to generate a bias voltage, connect it to VDD, simply size the W by L. Yeah, it has to have a very low current. So it's possible that you want to size its L larger than its W also to some range, right? Or you can cascade a series of transistors to obtain the same effect. Huh. Let me tell you why it has to be a, so your question is why it should be low or why we need the current in the first place? Why should it be weak, right? So, uh, so let me directly give you the answer, right? So the moment I connect a weak current source, I will have some finite delay even when VC is equal to zero. Right, because there is always a discharge path. Now, as your VC increases above VT, the effect of the VC transistor is going to dominate. Right, so then this will go and join the existing curve. Now, if your current source was not weak, it will be much lower than the existing curve. Both of them, the discharge current provided by uh, the the second transistor might also be dominating enough. Now, even in this scenario, the curve is going to be slightly lower than the existing curve because for every value of VC, now you have increased the available current by a small amount, by some IV. So it will be just slightly lower than the existing current, but usually the difference is not very appreciable. Okay. Uh, previously, the white curve, huh. while the uh, curve was going up, Huh. Right. So now you have, we are looking at this inverter, right? You have given a rising edge. If the VC was lower than VT, that means this transistor is off, right? So there is no path for the current to discharge. If there is no path for the current to discharge, your output is not going to come down, right? And we have defined our delay from the rising edge to the falling edge, 50 percentage points. But if there is no falling edge, then I cannot measure TPH. So we say it is infinite or undefined, one of them. So you don't draw any points. You can't draw anything uh, lesser than VT. So now what we have done is, so let's say this was your inverter, like the conventional inverter. I'm adding the VC path here. Now we are providing another path here with a weak current source. So when VC is lesser than VT, this path doesn't exist, right? 
So the capacitance is getting discharged like this through the weak current source, which is. We are not able to the current right. So if you want to, uh, you can think of other ways to control it if required. But in usual cases, you have a very good tunability between VT to VTT. Right. right? And of course, this will not be exactly flat. You'll have some subthreshold conduction. So the point is going to look right. something like this. Right? But you will have some constant region here. And you will typically have something constant around this side also. Right? And then you'll have a large variation in between period. Is this okay? Now, let's say, so let me build the whole circuit for you. So we start with the inverter. So we took the inverter, then we added two paths in the pull down path. So we have introduced the tuning variable we see here, and we gave a constant weak current source by connecting it to VDD. Let's say I want to introduce similar tunability on the PMOS side also. So let's start copying. Let me first put in the weak current source, right? So I have a PMOS which is connected to ground. Perfect. PMOS connected to VC. Is this correct? Now, as VC increases, what happens to the discharging current? Does it increase or decrease? VC increases, the discharging current increases, right? This was the... Right. So now as VC increases, what happens to the charging current? Decreases. So they are in opposite direction, right? What should I do now? We want to have the behavior opposite to that here. If VC is increasing, we want some voltage that is decreasing. Minus VC is, huh, because let's say we are working from zero to VDD range, right? So I want some something like a VC bar. Is that clear why we want VC bar? Because here when I increase VC, the discharge current is increasing, the TPHL is decreasing. But here if the VC is increasing, the charging current is decreasing, that means TPLH is increasing. We want both to move in roughly the same direction. Okay, so I need a signal which has the opposite behavior, which I'll call as VC bar. Actually, VDD minus VC. Roughly, VDD minus VC. So how can I, now in the loop, you have only VC as a signal. How can I generate a VC bar? Huh, how do I generate it? I put an inverter, let's say. So now let's say my uh, VC value for a VDD equal to one volt was around, let's say 350 millivolt. If I put an inverter, what would be the output? Yeah, the, this will eventually drive up to VDD. Right, so it cannot be an inverter. Right, it has to be some sort of a bias circuit. And with something that roughly follows this direction, even if it is not exactly VDD minus VC, you can tweak the W by L of it and get the approximate behavior that you need. Okay. So let me give you a suggestion. If I have a ah, something similar to a common source amplifier with an active load, the circuit like this. So if VC increases, this node is going to decrease. So I can use this as my bias generation circuit. So let me sketch it here. So 
So this is VC. This is my VC bar, and I can connect. So the from the capacitor in the DLL, you will get VC. VC is given to this inverter. I generate VC bar and apply it here. So this is my one inverter that forms part of the uh, delay line, right? So now this is one unit of the delay line. So we call this as voltage controlled delay unit. Right? This is actually a very generic term. It This can apply to any unit in a delay line whose delay is controlled by voltage, right? Not just to this particular architecture. Okay, so now I have one inverter whose delay can be tuned. I cascade two such inverters, I will have a tunable buffer. Cascade enough of these tunable buffers, I have a tunable delay line, okay? So now the same VC and VC bar can be applied to all of these buffers. There isn't any particular reason to have multiple bias generation circuits associated with every buffer. Okay, because the same voltage, the current is not being drawn from these points, right? So you can have the same circuit uh, part of it. So now let me show you the delay line in full picture. Yeah. So this is the first inverter whose delay is getting tuned through VC and VC bar. I cascade two of them. I have a tunable buffer. I cascade two such buffers. I have a slightly larger delay line and I can cascade as many stages I want. And I have a bias circuit on the side. Is this clear? All right. Is there any reason to use the error connector? To... You can use any uh, bias generation circuit as you require. Yeah. So if you want to put a resistor, you can do that. But then you will have to, usually you'll find that the resistor size will be much larger than the area that will be taken up by a transistor for the same value of gain that you're looking Okay, so now we have built a circuit. Anytime you see a circuit in analog, the next question we ask is, what is the gain associated with it? Right, so what we have to now define a gain for this delay line. What is the general definition of gain? So you have a system, input is there, output is there. You make a small change in input and you observe the change occurring at the output. So now for a unit change in input, whatever is the change happening at the output, that gives you the gain, right? So we follow the same definition, but we first have to identify the input and output of interest, right? So let us look at the inputs and outputs for a circuit. So what we have is a delay line. Can you tell me the inputs? So there is in, and there is VC. And the outputs? Because there is a gain defined for the delay line. And that gain information is needed to analyze the delay lock loop. It is a negative feedback loop. We'll see that in a minute, right? So the reason is, anytime you have a negative feedback loop, you have to check for stability, yeah. which means you have to model it. You have to worry about the zeros, poles, what are the gains appearing in every stage. So you're putting a module there. You need to at least figure out how to define the gain. Why right? one? Okay. Sure. So we haven't defined the gain yet. You have to see what is the definition of the gain. Then we can comment on what that value should be. Tell me about the outputs. So you have out. Is there any other parameter that is of interest to us? No, we are looking only at the delay line. The delay, right? So the delay of this chain is also relevant to us. In fact, the DLL, for the DLL, this delay is probably the most important factor, right? So we are also interested in the delay of this chain. So now the gain is defined from VC to TD. Okay. So the gain of the delay line, which we represent as K, 
subscript DL is defined as same definition as before. You make a small change in VC, how much does my delay change by? Right. In other words, derivative of the delay with respect to VC. And this is same as the, if I plot a delay versus VC curve, this will be same as the slope of the delay versus VC curve. Under locking conditions, yes. Right? Under locking conditions, you want it to lock to T-clock. So that is like your bias point now. Right? Now, on top of that, if there is a small fluctuation in VC, what happens to the delay? It is going to fluctuate around T-clock by a small amount. So KDL tells you by how much it is going to fluctuate. So now we are trying to define the gain for the delay line. And the outputs of outputs that are relevant to us are TD and VC. No, no. TD is the delay from input to output. It is not a voltage signal. It is now a time quantity. And that is the delay from input to the output. All right. So your... We are interested in the output signal so that we can compare the input and output waveforms and bring that... Correct. And why are we interested? So that the delay between in and out is equal to T clock. Right. So the parameter that is relevant when we discuss a delay line is T clock. T clock is also a relevant parameter. And the definition of gain is between T clock and the VC. So if I in and out. Correct. Right. So this is your input waveform. Your output waveform is going to be some delayed version. Right? And this delay is now TD. Now, if I change VC, the shift edge is going to shift, which is going to vary the TD. So the definition of gain is between this delay and the VC change. So how can you be seen? Out is a voltage domain signal, which is switching from 0 to VDD with some rise time and fault time. TD is the delay information. It is a time domain information. Yes, gain supposed to be some kind of huh. So what change will it uh, uh, occur in out? Huh. So again, this, is, this gain is a small signal gain, right? So if I look at... So let me look at the VC waveform. I'll answer your question in a minute. So let's say I had TD versus VC. And we saw that the curve for the particular architecture we spoke is going to be something like this, where this is also some finite value, right? Now, let's say you are at some point here, corresponding to some VC one. Let's say corresponding to this, you have a delay T0. Now, I make a small change in VC, which means my delay is also going to vary by some small amount. If this is confusing, I'll put a small change like this. Okay. So which means now my signal is going to appear here. Now the definition of the gain is such that you are linearizing this curve around this point. Okay. Now, if that change is small, then you can linearize the curve around this and you'll be able to calculate this based on the linear model. Same as what you do in voltage domain feedback signals, right? You have a bias point. On top of it, you apply a very small change in your input. Now you make a small signal model based on GM, RTS, etc., corresponding to that bias point. And that is now a linear model. You have linearized the behavior of your circuit for small changes around the particular bias point. Right? So then you, you find out the small signal gain and multiply the input with the small signal gain and that gives you your output. Okay? So similarly, you can identify what should be the new delay by using small signal analysis. You linearize the curve at that point and based on that, you can uh, identify what is the change that is occurring. So if you make a small change like this, 
Now the linear model will tell you that you have made a small change in output like this. So your new delay is here. So it's usually as much as smaller we we will be happy and it is not really. Why should KDL be small? So there will be not much fluctuation between TD and the actual key clock which you want. So if you had a amplifier, right? KDL is now equivalent to the amplifier gain, right? So we do the small signal analysis for small fluctuations in the input, but we usually want the gain to be large, right? So following the same principles, we would want the so the value of KDL depends on the circuit implementation, but it's not necessary that the KDL has to be small, right? In a lot of cases, we want the KDL to be large. And the uh, analysis is valid when you have small signal fluctuations on it. So what's the fix uh, Correct. We would ideally want any small operation to actually not affect speed. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that again depends on the application. Error, right? right. So if there is a small error now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say the temperature changed by small value, right? Now, if the gain is small, it means that the loop is going to take a long time to settle, right? So roughly, again, you don't know the full structure of the loop. So some of these terms, uh, some of these sentences I make, you'll have to take it uh, you know, with a pinch of salt. Once you understand the full structure, these things will be clear. So if your KDL value is very small, which means the loop is going to settle very slowly. Not very small, but in the middle, not too high, not too small. If so, so again, the one of the things that determines how you want to choose the KDL is the uh, speed at which you want the circuit to settle. KDL is a design parameter for you when you are. Um, not completely. KDL is a design parameter. And as a designer, you have a choice as to what the value should be when you are designing the delay line. And there are system level constraints which will help you determine what that value should be. So basically, KDL is influenced by the basic so Correct. It is, it is influenced by how you. Uh, yeah, how you design your uh, inverter, tunable inverter. Okay, for KDL is like, uh, what we are designing, uh, and VC is like, uh, the, uh, thing, right? VC is an input. VC is an input. VC will influence the uh, delay. The relationship between that delay and VC is characterized using the gain KDL. Is that clear? Okay, so I'll take two more minutes. What should be the unit of KDL? What should it be? Seconds per, per whole second. Huh. Now, you know how to shift between delay and phase. Therefore, it is uh, sometimes you also represent KDL as radians per volt. So if the relationship it is between delay and uh, VC, it's called as seconds per volt. CC to shift a delay to phase. So then you can also represent it in radians per volt. Okay. So again, KDL is basically the slope of the delay versus VC curve. So the slope is the KDL at that particular VC. And what name should we give to this particular architecture? So here we have tuned by tuning the discharging current, charging discharging current. So this method is popularly known as tuning by variable resistors. Right? Now by adding the additional transistor, we have basically starved the inverter of the current. The current has reduced, right? So this architecture is also called as current starved inverter. So by tuning the uh, discharging or charging current, you are effectively tuning the resistance of the pull-up and pull-down. So that is another way to think about the same circuit. Okay, so we can end the lecture here. So Monday's lecture is uh, Professor Nagendra's lecture on oscillators. And... Thank you.